learn about the newest digital pathology trends in science and industry, meet the most interesting people in the niche, and gain insights relevant to your own projects. Here is where pathology meets computer science. You are listening to the Digital Pathology Podcast with your host, Dr. Alexandra Jura. Hi, everyone. This is Alexandra Zhurab, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Digital Pathology Podcast. I'm joined today by Nathan Bookbinder, co-founder and chief product officer of Prosia. Nathan started Prosia in 2015 alongside his fellow co-founders, David West and Coleman Stavish. In his role as Prosia's chief product officer, Nathan defines the company's product strategy and roadmap and delivers market-ready technology to the growing digital and computational pathology market. Nathan obtained his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Johns Hopkins University and subsequently received his master's in biomedical innovation development from the Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I am really excited to have him on the show today. Hi, Nathan. Uh, It's great to have you as my guest today. Thank you for having me, Alexandra. And so let's start with uh, telling our guests about yourself and your entrepreneurial journey. Absolutely. Uh, My name is Nathan Bookbinder. I'm the chief product officer and a co-founder here at Prosha. Prosha is a digital pathology and computational pathology software company. My journey with Prosha began back in 2014, early 2015. Uh, And so I was doing research in a lab, uh, as was my colleague, David, um, who's, who's our CEO. And what David found and what I could attest to as well through my own experience, and I'm sure plenty of uh, researchers in the pathology space could replicate, uh, is that there's really a big problem in the pathology lab with regards to technology adoption. There's all this talk about big advances in computation and computational medicine, but it really hadn't hit pathology and that was where I think it was needed the most, where you saw uh, big challenges with being consistent and efficient in the identification of various patterns and correlations to various outcomes in assessing tissue specimen. And so you know, me, David, Coleman, uh, saw this as an opportunity to really change the way that the world practices pathology. And so we, we took it from there. Mm-hmm. I built up the company. We're now... Uh, a 30-person company based here in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and uh, have really grown it into a thriving business. We're, we're excited to uh, continue to shape that vision. So uh, that was, um, what, five years ago? Yeah, and a little less than five years ago. Exactly. And uh, like you say, um, there is so much talk about um, going digital, advancing through technology, Pathology is not at the forefront of this trend. So it's great that, uh, that you're trying to advance that. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And it's interesting that it's not at the forefront because for such a long period of time in the history of medicine, you know, call it the late 1800s through the mid 1900s, pathology was the innovative space in medicine. It was the area of most advancement and discovery in terms of our understanding of disease and for whatever reason that stopped, call it in the 1960s or 70s. Not that research stopped, but uh, the position of pathology as being the key determiner of how we interpret diseases like cancer or other diseases as well. Um, We see this new wave of computational pathology, of innovation in AI, machine learning, cloud computing, and those other various technologies as another opportunity to take pathology and uh, really reinvigorate it. Okay. Um, so tell me, what is the mission of Prussia? Yeah, so our mission is to change the way that the world practices pathology. Um, we see this as a, a really transformative period in medicine as a whole. And so we're, we're, on a mission to leverage uh, computer intelligence to reshape how we're thinking about 
diseases like cancer and leveraging that to ultimately uh, drive clinical insights that impact the patient. And why is this important? Why is this important in pathology space explicitly? It's critically important in the pathology space. You really don't get diagnosed with cancer unless the pathologist says that you're diagnosed with cancer. It's fundamental to how we understand disease. Um, and I, I feel that I'm maybe preaching to the choir a bit, but for, for anyone in the audience who doesn't know, pathology really truly is uh, that center point at which cancer is first diagnosed, at which it's first understood, um, and where most clinical treatments and uh, and treatment plans get started. Uh, it's where we understand prognosis and likelihood of survival, likelihood of metastasis. And so anything that we can do to tackle some of these incredibly impactful diseases that are increasingly prevalent in our society and around the world, um, anything we can do to tackle that early in the pathology lab really has the potential to dramatically impact millions of patients' lives. Yes, I think... In the era of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we often kind of forget that it all starts with the pathologist and with the diagnosis, like you say. So having that in mind is very important, very important to the success of, of digital pathology companies, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Cancer is at its core a disease of the tissue and pathology at its core is a study of tissue. So uh, anything we can do to tie those more closely together and drive additional insight really has the power to, to be very impactful. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about your team. You mentioned yourself and David as the founders of the company. Who else is crucial to your team at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So there's myself, uh, David, and Coleman, who's our chief technology officer. Uh, we're the three founders of Crocia. Um, I say that knowing full well that our entire team is built of entrepreneurial minds and spirits. We really wouldn't have been able to take an idea and execute on it and build on it and expand on it conceptually and in terms of the product itself and uh, the market that we're serving without an incredible group of people around us. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, we've, we've got products in the market. We've also got really innovative technology. I, uh, pretty solid group, a hardcore group of engineers, both on the platform infrastructure uh, and development side, as well as uh, on the more scientific and artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning side of the house. And so uh, our company would not be anywhere close to where it is today without the incredible people that power the work that we do day to day. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a crucial component. So tell me about the, your products and services that you currently offer at Prussia. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, our vision has always been, like I said, to change the way that the world practices pathology, to drive additional insight. And at its core, while at its core, what we've uh, recognized as the manifestation of that is computational pathology is AI applications is machine learning and deep learning and other powerful analytic tools that really shape uh, how we interpret tissue specimen. However, it's nearly impossible from a practical standpoint to deliver those kinds of AI or analytic uh, applications into the pathology lab without some kind of vehicle, without a way of uh, having a conduit between the pathologist, mm -hmm. the whole slide images, the, the data that you're creating, the images that you're capturing from tissue specimen, um, and the analytics that you're actually looking to run. And so what we offer today are two broad product categories. The first is Concentric. Concentric is our digital pathology platform, and it serves as an image and workflow management system for both academic and uh, life science research organizations, as well as for uh, clinical operational laboratories that are, are processing a patient specimen uh, to really deliver an experience that allows pathologists to say, hey, I can actually realistically see a world in which I might shift a big bulk of my work away from the microscope and onto the computer, onto the software platform for collaboration purposes, for analytic purposes, for uh, just performance and operational improvements. That's one one category of our products is concentric, our platform. 
on top of that, and really leveraging Concentric as a launch pad, we have a whole suite of AI modules, of disease-specific AI modules, okay. the first of which we released mm -hmm. in uh, June of this year. It's called Derm AI, um, mm -hmm. and it leverages artificial intelligence in a workflow capacity to drive operational efficiency and performance improvements uh, in, a, in a true pathology setting. Uh, and so we anticipate expanding both the platform and the AI modules, but uh, today we serve a, a wide range of users with a pretty robust and enterprise-oriented set of solutions. Okay, so concentric as the image uh, and workflow management and then different modules that are uh, integrated with concentric and uh, for now it's the dermatopathology module, right? Exactly, with several soon to follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you already mentioned uh, who your target audience is, but tell me a little bit more about your customers. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been in the market with the product for a bit over three years now, probably closer to four years. And in that time, we've brought on some incredible partners and customers. Um, the concentric platform actually has a couple of uh, different versions of it that gear it towards one target segment or another. So on the academic and uh, educational research side of, uh, side of the pathology ecosystem. Uh, Concentric currently serves some of the biggest academic centers uh, in the country and even in the world. So mm -hmm. Johns Hopkins is an example of, of an education and research customer of ours. So is UPenn. So is Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Okay. Um, so around the country and around the world serving some of these very large uh, research organizations that are generating massive amounts of data the product Concentric also serves um, as a platform for life sciences organizations. Um, so groups like it's CROs and pharma companies, um, big and small. Uh, an example of a, a pretty large uh, CRO that we serve uh, is uh, a group that's based out, in, uh, out on the East Coast that uses our product to, um, to really manage their day-to-day -day work. This group, NSA Labs, Neuroscience uh, Associates, mm -hmm. is uh, kind of at the cutting edge of technology uh, and its application in the delivery of CROs services uh, throughout the life sciences spaces, not only for you know, their own internal work, but also as a way to deliver results uh, more expeditiously to their own clients. And then uh, on the true workflow side, uh, so not focused on life sciences or on academic research or education, but on the true workflow and clinical enterprise side, we've got some uh, large organizations that are using Concentric uh, that are using not just Concentric, but even our AI products as well. So University of Florida is an example of one such institution where um, they're, they're deploying the product in practice, looking at cases, uh, not just retrospectively, but prospectively on our platform and uh, doing so in a way that really is transforming how they're looking at, at specific specialties. And I forgot to ask you, what platform does, or what hardware does your uh, product, the Concentric, run on? We work with nearly every hardware company. So we can take images in almost any image format. Mm -hmm. uh, including the most common image formats out there. Um, so whether that's uh, the Leica uh, SVS format or any format that's similar to a TIFF, uh, we can work with the uh, Ventana Roche scanners, we can work with the uh, Hamamatsu scanners, we can work with the 3D Histech scanners, which are distributed by uh, what was formerly Thermo Fisher in the US. So a wide range of bright field images, a very comprehensive list of those image formats, as well as fluorescent images, um, as well as Z-Stack images. Um, and increasingly we're seeing requests and we're fulfilling those requests for other imaging modalities that are not something you traditionally expect from uh, you know, software that's uh, you know, from one lens, uh, a replacement of the microscope. Mm -hmm. So basically you're 
format or a scanner agnostic with uh, with concentric that's great yeah. and regarding the personal computer does it have to be a more powerful one do you need um, some special computer to use your your platform or the normal lab computers are enough normal lab computers are more than sufficient um, okay. we have a big focus on cloud we believe mm -hmm. that cloud uh, affords any laboratory the opportunity to build out a robust and infinitely scalable uh, digital pathology deployment, which is important given just how large some of these images are and just how powerful and computationally expensive uh, some of these analytics solutions are. Um, mm -hmm. However, even for an on-premises deployment, even for something that's being deployed locally, which we do on occasion uh, perform, you know, our, our software is lightweight. It's something that you can operate from not just any computer, but really any device as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess that's important um, because digitalization and digital pathology already requires a lot of investment. So making this part of it light is definitely a big advantage. Uh, exactly. It's, you know, that's one side of it is it's a way of uh, protecting the investment and reducing the amount that needs mm -hmm. to be spent up front. The other side of it is you know, even a little bit more practical than that, which is you know, digital pathology is a change. Digital pathology is not a matter of doing something that you've done before, but slightly different. It, it really is a radical departure from how you've operated in a laboratory for the past 30 or 40 years. And so uh, you know, when we look to deploy and when we're looking to build out a solution for a laboratory, we want to do as much as we possibly can to have the pathologists, the histotechs, the lab managers, operations, um, the medical team feel as comfortable as possible on concentric and as they're using our AI applications. And that means um, minimizing the amount of uh, disruption that there is to their day-to-day -day work. That's, that's something that's central to how we deliver our solutions. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the most valuable contribution uh, to the field of digital pathology that you have already delivered or maybe that you plan delivering? Yeah, so maybe because this is such a, a recent announcement, but the thing that's at the front of my mind is you know, we delivered in June the first commercially available, generally available uh, deep learning products into the pathology space with truly clinical applications. That's something that is remarkable. It's something that if you had talked to most pathologists two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, or talked to uh, even many pathologists today who might not have heard of Derm AI, it, and ask them how long it's going to take for AI to start reshaping how we're thinking about pathology, many of them would say, it's three years, four years, five years away. Some would say it's longer than that. And you know, what we're demonstrating now and what we've demonstrated through this release is that this isn't something that's an eventuality. This is something that's, that's here, that's um, to a certain degree inevitable, um, but without the negative connotation of uh, radical negative change instead uh, is something that's an opportunity for these laboratories to take advantage of major revolutions in computation and in technology and in pathology. Um, and it starts with an application like Derm AI. So I'd say that's probably the biggest contribution to date, although there are, are several others. I'm sure if I, I was looking to be a bit more expansive, we could find something else. I am, I am so happy, so to say, that the AI is actually creeping in into the pathology labs. It's going to be a process. Not everybody's going to adopt it immediately. And pathologists have to get used to it. So I'm very happy that there is something that then they can already start using. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, for any technology, take uh, next generation sequencing as an example, or even many genetic applications. For many of those technologies, it wasn't that suddenly you flipped a light switch and every single uh, medical expert who was impacted by this technology was using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Something that took a little bit of time, but the introduction of the first applications in NGS 
really did serve as that point in time where if you were to put a pin on a timeline and say, where did things change? That was the moment that it changed. And we see, we see ourselves in a very similar position. And definitely every technology requires some time to be adopted. I still remember where I, when I didn't want to buy a digital camera because I thought my analog one is so fantastic and I'm going to lose something. And now I don't own an analog anymore. Exactly. And you would never think of going back. And exactly. Yeah. And that transformation is the same same thing that we expect to see in the pathology lab as well. It's just a matter of getting everybody to the point where they take a look at their current analog cameras and say, you know what, this really doesn't work for us anymore. Um, any resistance that we've had in the past just doesn't bear any weight. Any of those old arguments just don't make any sense. And we probably need to start switching over to digital, um, whether it's for cameras or for <laughs> or pathology. Pathology or any other technology, you're right. So how do you work with pathologists for developing your, your products, your services, current and future ones? We do have some pathologists on our team. Um, mm. However, when we're looking to deliver products to the market, what we depend on, what we rely on is engagement with our future customers, with our partners and our prospects. And so um, I think it would be fair to say that our customers, partners, prospects, um, are as much a part of the development process as the engineers who build the technology. In fact, we have members of our team who are dedicated specifically to going out to the market and understanding what problems have remained unaddressed, how best to solve them, how that manifests itself in terms of software. And we never release technology without having run it by you know, many of our existing customers first. Uh, in our minds, the worst thing that could happen uh, for digital pathology is the introduction of technology that doesn't work or that works but doesn't solve a real problem that pathologists need to have addressed. And so we're very cognizant of the role that the pathologist plays in shaping their own future and shaping what digital pathology looks like in the, year, in the years to come. Mm -hmm. I think that's crucial too. So you are an innovative company, um, per definition already, but can you tell me what innovation means to you and how you innovate in Prussia? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's probably two ways of thinking about innovation. One way is thinking about innovation as taking something that exists already and doing some kind of manipulation to improve on it. The other way is to take a look at a problem that exists and develop a radically new way of solving it. At Prosha, I think we kind of blend the two, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. So at our core, we truly are introducing something that has the potential to be disruptive. So it really is that second kind of innovation, the one that's a radical change, a radical departure from anything that we've seen before. Um, however, the laboratory space and medicine as a whole is relatively conservative for good reason. You know, we're talking about patients' lives. We're talking about practices that have been developed and well-studied over the course of the past several hundred years. Um, we're looking at a profession that's you know, foundations, that, that's principled on this core concept of providing consistency and providing certainty in areas that matter the most. And so when we look at innovation, what we're trying to do is balance those two concepts, balance the need for massive change and the opportunity that presents for labs with the concept that there are certain aspects of the medical profession that need to remain constant, that, that really drive home at the fact that there's a patient at the end of the story who expects to have uh, a person in front of them, that expects to have that person be their source of insight and knowledge. Uh, and uh, you know, innovation at Prosha is really founded on that concept of entrepreneurialism, bearing the end user and the end recipient of this information in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So AI is, of course, uh, part of the innovation in the space, and you already have an AI um, application. Um, tell me, what problem did using AI solve that you couldn't solve before? 
So until we had AI, what we were able to do is solve problems where we already kind of knew what the answer was. We could solve mm -hmm. problems where we knew that there was a visual similarity between the histology on a tissue, uh, on any given tissue, and the end outcome that we're trying to correlate it to. Mm -hmm. If you know exactly what that pattern is, or if you have an idea of what that pattern is, you can start to build your own non-artificial intelligence, non-deep learning application to address that problem. So uh, maybe IHC quantification is a good mm -hmm. example of that, where you know, you know that what you're looking to measure is the expression levels of various proteins or various biomarkers um, in a given specimen. And usually it's a pretty straightforward measurement that you're looking to make as well. It's intensity, for example. Mm -hmm. But where AI comes into play, where traditional uh, computational techniques fall short is where the patterns are a little bit more complex or they're a little bit harder to describe as a single variable or where you may not even know exactly what the pattern is in the first place, but you do know that there is some correlation between what you're looking at under the microscope and what the end outcome is for the patient, whether that's survival or response to therapy or any other metric that you're interested in. That's where AI is not just a nice application, not just a way of doing things, it's really the way of doing things. It's the only way to solve those kinds of big problems. Mm -hmm. So the patterns that we're, we may not be aware of, but yeah. uh, which are probably there. Exactly. Or even for patterns that we're aware of, but mm -hmm. for which we have a difficult time finding uh, a way of effectively communicating that on a consistent basis. The other area, by the way, where AI has the potential to really be the only uh, innovative solution is uh, for patterns that exist that the pathologist does not typically encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. What I mean, for example, is the pathologist in most contexts, does not do a 10-year follow-up with every single one of their patients. Of However, there are almost certainly trends in 10-year follow-up data between the histology, the original specimen, and maybe the likelihood of recurrence of a, a tumor sample at, after 10 years, or the survival after 10 years, or occurrence of other disease after 10 years. So that's something where AI is really the only approach to take for those kinds of robust and complicated uh, forms of pattern recognition, something where it really is going beyond the current practice of pathology and therefore requires solutions that can uh, intelligently identify these, these patterns and translate it into something that the pathologist can use. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, I guess that's going to be the future that is already the present with with your uh, application and uh, being introduced to the market is there anything i should have asked you but i didn't so far anything else that you would like the listeners to know about the only thing that i'll say and i'll i think this is maybe a bit of a reiteration of something that i said a few minutes ago uh, is that it's wrong to think about this wave of innovation as being optional. And it's wrong to think about this wave of innovation as being 10 years away. I think mm -hmm. we're looking at a space that's changing rapidly and for which there's going to be solutions that really drive the future of how we look at specific specialties. And so what I'd say to anyone who's listening, who hasn't already taken a serious look at digital pathology uh, in any capacity is that now is the time to start acting before it, it turns from something that you have the time to consider to something that's an urgent necessity. Okay, thank you very much. Before we finish, just one more thing. Where can the listeners find you online to find more about your offer? Absolutely, you can visit us at our website. It's www.prosha.com. That's P-R-O-S-C-I-A dot com. Mm -hmm. We're going to include the link in the podcast notes. Thank you okay. very much, Alexandra. Thank you so much for, for being my guest and making us aware of uh, what you're doing. Good luck with everything. And uh, I am keeping my fingers crossed for more AI applications and for your success. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. 
For more great digital pathology resources, visit the Digital Pathology Consulting website and subscribe to our newsletter on digitalpathologyconsulting.com. After subscribing, you will get access to the free annotation guidelines, which will help you annotate slides consistently in all your digital pathology projects. Talk to you in the next episode.